Welcome to the show. Today I'm talking to a cessationist and a charismatic Christian asking our tongues, prophecy and charismatic gifts for today. Andrew Wilson is a church leader and theologian who believes the charismatic gifts of the Spirit continue in the church today. His new book, Spirit and Sacrament, an invitation to eucharismatic worship, seeks to show the value of bringing tradition, liturgy and Eucharist together with the dynamic power of the gifts of the Spirit. Simon Arscott is a church leader who believes gifts such as tongues, prophecy and healing were only present in the early church and that with the close of scripture, the charismatic gifts ceased. Well, Andrew and Simon, welcome to the show today. It's great to have you both. Um, you. Haven't done this topic in a little while. <coughs> Cessationism, the charismatic gifts of the spirit and so on. Before we get into the debate, um, let's find out a little bit about you both. Perhaps as you're new to the show, Simon, it would be good to hear a bit of your background. Have you... Uh, Always had a faith? Uh, has it always been in the Reformed sort of tradition? Uh, yes, so I was born in a, to a believing home and uh, like godly parents who taught me the Bible uh, from, from very young. Um, and yeah, it would be a, a Reformed background kind of church. Because mm. you um, lead a uh, Presbyterian church. That's today, right. So I'm the minister of All Nations Church Ilford now um, in East London, where I've been for three years. And um, so I, I haven't moved far theologically, I think I'd, it's fair to say, mm -hmm. um, but um, hold those convictions um, with with enthusiasm and um, uh, a lot, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'd call, call myself a Pentecostal. I'm happy to call, call myself a Pentecostal. Pentecostal, uh, as in, okay. uh, but we'll come on to that, I guess. Okay, but, um, with with certain caveats. <laughs> uh, yeah, as in, but I'm big into Pentecost. Like Pentecost is essential to um, right. Sure. How, how I'd think. I'm happy to use language of charismatic, as we're, we're going to come on to. But um, but you, uh, would, but I am reformed, and I would call myself a cessationist. A cessationist, yeah. right? Yeah. That, that's that's the key thing I think and and it is, yeah. um, I mean before we get into that um, have you um, spoken with seen experienced in any way the, the charismatic wing of the church um yes um, I, I've never been in long term a charismatic church uh, but I know people who who are I've had people visiting churches who are from char of charismatic conviction uh, so I, I do feel I've interacted mm. with people and read certainly read lots of stuff and seen lots of um, yeah, I feel like it, conscious of what's out there in the wider Christian mm, world. Mm. Um, I mean, every church is different, but what? how does your church kind of look like on a Sunday morning? Um, do, do you kind of go in for, I don't know, what you might see in the average, quote unquote, evangelical charismatic church in terms of a, a band and, you know, lively music and, you know, yeah. people sort of raising hands in the air? Or, or does it tend to kind of... Be that you you tend to kind of keep things more formal, let's say. Yeah, probably. I think people would say we're, we're fairly formal, um, as the average as the average church goes. Like because we're, we're new, we don't even have musicians yet. Like oh, in, right. so, we we have managed to get a, a one or two pianists to help out. But mm. musically, like, I'd love us to to keep progressing musically mm. and, and improve that. But um, yeah, it'd be fairly. Um, so simplicity in the service would be a big mm. big feature, mm. and that'd be true of Presbyterians in, in general. Uh, so simple, reverent. Uh, I mean to be joyful and um, grateful, but but very much wor like word centered. Yeah. That the sermon being the centre of um, of the service. So we we believe we're gathering there to meet with the living God. He talks to us. We talk back. Um, uh, so, but yeah. But in terms of, I think for most people walking in who from a charismatic evangelical background, we would be, oh wow, okay, you're you're fairly formal, but. Um, yeah. I guess it's it's often about what what you're used to. And, I, I'm and, sure it is. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and even the the churches that claim that they have no, you know, set uh, liturgy or formalism, they've they've got formalisms of their own yeah. in, in very often. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and the, you bring that up in your book, Andrew. Uh, the yeah. fact that uh, whether you like it or not, you probably do have some kind of a liturgy in your service, even if you don't think you do, because yeah. actually we've all got habits and ways of doing things yeah it, it, it's it's i often makes me laugh when people say oh no we don't do that we don't have formal do you think well, okay do you ever sing a song and say, well what's that then that's just a that's just we recite words but we do them to music <laughs> and then you sort of go and visit their church and you think i think you say the phrase by the way visitors we're not after your money every single week <laughs> like you are you know what I mean or whatever it might be yeah, or welcome yeah. or i think the uh, the ship of fools website came around to a church i was in as a teenager and they had to try and make a note of various things to appraise the meeting mm. and they said one of the lines they had was what's the opening line given in the service and it turned out it was one of the pastors who said and i quote oh all right i suppose we'd better get on with it <laughs> which so in the you know you have liturgy even if it's yeah. terrible liturgy and he was awful, he was so embarrassed but yeah. even if it's awful you still have it you fall into yeah. patterns and i don't yes. think that's a bad thing but i think it's important for us to appraise them and work out is yeah. this good is it edifying is it you know all that what, stuff. what's your background andrew you've been um i think you've experienced a few different types of church in your in your life i, I mean most of your adult life though has been spent in the charismatic church yeah it has so. yeah so I, in fact i was i was um 
christened as a baby at St. Helen's Bishopsgate, which would be a sort of very conservative, reformed Anglican church, which I'm very, very grateful for. Um, that's where my parents became believers. And then what jumped from that sort of bastion of reformed, very conservative, definitely not, I mean, charismatics at the time were the Colossian heresy when my, when my parents left. And they then jumped into what was pretty much a charismatic commune. And so sort of total culture shock for Gosh. them, I suppose. And I then grew up remembering that, then got a bit burnt by that and ended up settling in an Anglican church um, for most of my childhood. And then they moved to a, a New Frontiers church, which is the network of churches I've been in ever since. Um, although with a, a sort of couple of breaks over through university, I was quite backslidden. Mm. But other than that, I have been in, in my churchmanship has been really sort of charismatic. Yeah, yeah. But I think that sort of, and my, but my parents are now, my dad been a church warden in a uh, Anglican church in the, in the country in Sussex. And my parents have got, you know, deep Anglican roots I've had for a long time, and I think that's for me too. So I've ended up with probably both the St. Helens Bishopsgate and the Charismatic <laughs> Commune components, at least in my, you know, growth as a Christian. Yeah. And, and and is 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 a reformed charismatic an oxymoron, or are are there more of you than just you? Well, <laughs> I, I think there are a lot of people who would who would claim. I'd certainly you would use both of those labels of yes. myself. Um, but I suspect, as we've already heard from Simon, that both the word reformed and the word charismatic would be used in subtly different mm. ways. So he would say, I'm a charismatic, but also a cessationist. And mm. of course, lots of people from my side of the water would go, well, what on earth is that? Sure. And similarly, I'd say, <laughs> I'm a reformed, but I also don't baptize babies. I'm a Baptist. And he'd go, what on earth is that? You know, mm. So in some ways, you're deliberately using the words yeah. in slightly, yeah. if I might say, even slightly mischievous or polemic ways. <laughs> both of us, and we, all, we always do, because we're trying to say, really, I believe in the doctrines of grace. I pretty much agree with every statement in the Heidelberg Catechism, but I also believe the spiritual gifts are for today and we would practice and speak in mm. languages and prophesying and healing and all that sort of stuff. So and my church now would look much more like a charismatic or even a Pentecostal church. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's, you know... Have, of, have you always been pretty comfortable, basically, in that kind of environment where, no. where people are prophesying, <laughs> speaking in tongues, uh, no, being slain I, in the spirit? <laughs> like, just drop that in at the end of the sentence. <laughs> I mean, I have... I, I think I was a teenager when, if listeners are familiar with the sort of what was the Toronto thing or whatever mm, you call it. it was in the kind of mid-90s, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and found the whole thing sometimes very... Uh, emotionally cathartic sometimes extremely bizarre sometimes mm. very, i just didn't really know quite what to make of it sometimes jumped in sometimes mm. you know it's kind of frightening scary and then has since gone on from there would find an awful lot of things that fly under the banner actually some things under the reform side as well but <laughs> certainly on the charismatic side where i would think wow that is yeah we're we're not going to do okay. that around here like that sort of that sort of thing but i've been very blessed by being in churches that have been led well mm. with a lot of discernment and wisdom which means i think that when i've seen those things happen they've usually been handled really wisely by somebody who's clarified and provided safety for the church if something odd is going on yeah. and leave you a little doubt of really how we're supposed to handle things biblically and that's what i try and model yeah. myself as well so. and, and in a sense the book i guess is trying to bring the best of both worlds together um yeah. the, the the traditions that you've come to appreciate i'm sure uh, with all your theology and the the study you've done and seeing it happen in other church traditions of liturgy and eucharist and and all those things that have kind of formed the bedrock for thousands of years of, yeah. of christian worship that we shouldn't simply jettison them yeah. now that we've got the well, yeah, I think renewal. I think our context has been at least, and a lot of this wouldn't be just true of charismatics. I think probably quite a lot of generic evangelicals um, mm. have, in the in the name of removing that which is religious, and it's not mm. always clear what that word yeah. means. It can simply mean something that's formal, in which I think your original mm. point is yeah. really key. That actually, we all have some sort of formal shape to our worship, but in the name of jettisoning that, have said anything that's old is therefore you know old hat and we need to get rid of it and we need to replace it with something else and actually the you know things like the and much of which i learned of course from the presbyterians and others like them the anglicans um to the doctrines of grace the sacraments that you know effectively what the gathering on sunday is intended to do and be and what kinds of practices should be included i've been really shaped by a lot it, of people it, from it, your it's you know, interesting Simon's tradition to, really. to read in the book when you talk about <clears throat> the the kind of the, even the furniture we use kind of says something about what we value in our services and so if your church basically has a worship band at the front and that's the focus and if communion happens it's in fold-up tables that get you mm -hmm. know put at the side that says something about where your priorities lie essentially yeah I've, in some ways it's a cheeky way of trying to make the point that we all nobody 
is passive with but we may not be aware of it but mm. nobody doesn't have a sort of center to the worshiping and even i think simon just cards on the table that's actually the ministry of the word is at the center of presbyterian yeah, yeah. worship and, the, and therefore i imagine if i was to go to your church i'd probably guess that even before yeah. I, the meeting had started mm. because i'd see where the pulpit is and i'd see a bible and i'd see bibles in the chairs or whatever it might be yeah and i think in the same way churches where there's a video screen or churches where there's an altar as of course in mm. some church there would be or even a massive icon stretching mm. right across the ceiling which is not my <laughs> flavor at all and i'm certain it's not yours but even then the, the centerpiece of worship is clearly defined even in the way you organize your space and then of course the way you organize your time mm. so in some ways it's just a way of saying we all have these systems and setups let's let's do them well okay um as i say the book covers some really interesting ground and we're not going to be able to do justice to it in today's show but we are going to be focusing on the question of the charismatic gifts of the spirit that sort of side of, of the equation in the book if you like um simon you've already said you're you're a cessationist but you are a pentecostalist you believe in pentecost to ca cash that out for us a yeah bit. yeah I, i'm being i mean i'm being deliberately cheeky for sure. pentecostal but um but just um i think one thing there's all kinds of misunderstandings i think that circulate around what it means to be a cessationist um and the kind of caricature will be you uh, don't believe in the spirit or the spirit was for the past um he's locked up in the bible um uh, you're not interested in Pentecost, and that's, I just think, that well, that wouldn't be true of me, and it wouldn't be true of the Reformed Presbyterian churches that I know. Um, Pentecost is a massively important event to understand the gospel. Um, it's when Jesus, the risen Jesus, pours out his spirit on the church, having accomplished redemption for us. So, um, so I, I guess it's, um, yeah, I, I think every Christian, to be a Christian, you must be a Pentecostal Christian. That, that, that's my point there. Um, but not in the. But obviously, most people when they hear the word Pentecostal yeah. Christian, they're they're thinking a second, of a second, ble a second of, blessing. Of a, kind of yeah, and so, what, and so, no, what and, began at the start of the twentieth century, yeah. and, and is and, and that's not that's not at all what world. I mean. So yeah, sure. so I'm I'm cessationist, and and by that I would mean, um, and the issues at stake I, I think are that Jesus Christ has fully revealed God, and that um, that's enough. We don't need yeah. extras. Okay. But in, in his in his incarnation, in his death, resurrection, ascension, pouring out of the Spirit and the gift of the apostles and the Scriptures, revelation has is com is as complete as can be, and that's that that's that's what it's all about. Okay, but and in in that sense, so if someone says, "I've had a word of knowledge, a prophecy, uh, I believe I had a gift of tongues," and and someone, you know, gave an interpretation of that, you would say that that is not actually what's going on because actually everything you need from god has been given to you in in the form of the bible yes simply yeah yeah um so what what is going on then it, what do you think is happening with people in the charismatic or pentecostal tradition who who do say they experience those kinds of events yeah i i once i'm a bit reluctant to go into it in the sense of i, I don't I, a lot of it, i don't know i don't in one right. sense i don't, don't feel the need to um to, to try and suss out what what's happening mm -hmm. um i think all kinds of um you know, at one level, so the issue of tongues, for example, like Hindu, there's examples of Hindu speaking in tongues. It's not, it, it, there's certain phenomena that can happen that don't automatically mean this is the, the work of the Spirit. Um, sometimes it would be a case of, of describing something that I'm fine with in a, with a different label. Um, but other times I don't. Um, I don't think that's what's going on. Uh, I would, basically, I would, as a minister, I would discourage people, or I would positively encourage people to, to rest satisfied in the fullness of the revelation in Jesus, of Jesus Christ in their scriptures. And you don't need the extra. So the Spirit is alive today. He is speaking loud and clear. He speaks on Sundays in our church. He speaks as you open up your Bible. Um, uh, God, God wants to be as close to you as you can possibly be. Um, and in the gospel, he comes cl as close to you as you can possibly be. I mean, and, uh, and yet, it's in, it's, it's, yeah. it, um, you don't need the extra. In that sense, I mean, uh, and admittedly, these, these are all somewhat subjective, but if, if you, you'd be uncomfortable with someone saying, I've received a prophecy or uh, tongues or, or anything like that, would simply someone saying, I've got. I feel that God is telling me to do such and such. You know, to begin this work or to, um, you know, go and speak to that person. Is it is even that sort of something that you would say mm, not quite sure about? Um, I, I think that kind of language one should be careful with. I think um, it can be misused. It can be an unhelpful way of talking. I, I'm certainly happy. I mean, God, God talks to me. God, mm. God leads me. So, um, but, I, I, but that's through specifically when you engage with the Bible. Or, or, or can there be sort of promptings, it's, it's, it, it, things that, that you think actually, well, yeah. So, so, of course, the Spirit can prompt me all kinds of ways, but it's always um, controlled, mastered, um, 
restricted to what has been revealed in Jesus Christ. Right. There isn't the extra. There's no. You're, new you're certainly not going to have any new revelation. There's not yet. So, so new, like. that cessation yeah. is all about. There's, there's no new revelation today. What, there's the work of the Spirit today in the is, is a glorious ministry that He's got, um, and, and that, you know it, we love the Holy Spirit. We love Pentecost. His ministry is to apply redemption, not to add extra knowledge that we lack. I'll come back to the the tongues issue in a minute because I, I want to play a clip of uh, a recent interview I had with Justin Welby on that subject, but. Andrew, that, that's, yeah, I'm sure you've heard this position many mm. times before. Um, the Bible's all you need. We don't need extra prophecies now, tongues. Those things were important perhaps in the early days of the church, but now we've got scripture. That's God's gift to us. We don't mm. need those, those aspects. Well, I obviously agree with, as you know, I'm going to say, I agree with actually quite a lot of that. Um, I don't agree with it all, and I think the difference is important, which is why we're here. Mm. But I think in, in many ways I'd want to affirm that. It certainly as it comes to the doctrine of redemption. I certainly don't think there's anything relating to the work of Christ, relating to the doctrines, the, effectively the doctrinal content of Christianity. I don't think any, I think the sufficiency of Scripture, which I would absolutely affirm, means that there's nothing that you need to know for your salvation, for godliness, that requires God to say something additional to what is revealed mm. in the Word. And in fact, I think that would be, I'm not saying that would be true of everybody who <laughs> would wear the label charismatic. I'm sure it isn't. Um, but that's that's the would, broad consensus, it, yeah, it yes. Would, yes, it would be. And certainly amongst anybody who would realistically come on yeah. a program like this to discuss yeah. it, I, I okay. think, you know. Um, so I think the difference really comes over, I, I think, two ways of approaching even the, the questions that Simon's raised. One, with respect to the question of does God, does God ever speak to you? So I think the idea is, you know, if you take some biblical examples, is it adding extra revelation to our understanding of the doctrine of redemption for as they were, you know, Acts 13, as they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set aside Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Because the Holy Spirit's already revealed that Paul is going to be sent on the mission mm -hmm. to go and reach the Gentiles. So in a sense, there's no new revelation and there's certainly no new, there's, it's certainly, you know, you're, you're not adding anything to your understanding mm -hmm. of the doctrine of God, of Christ, of the, the creeds, the confessions, anything, when Paul says, I tried to get into Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit didn't let me. And then I woke up in the night and had, had a dream and he said, go over to, to Thessalonica. And I, in many ways, I see far more continuity between that sort of phenomenon and Hudson Taylor standing on Brighton Beach and feeling led of God to go to China and many, many other examples, or Charles Spurgeon um, preaching and then having a, a sense in his spirit from the, from the Holy Spirit that there is a man who has stolen a very specific amount of money. I tell the story in the book, and mm. it says this man sold to Satan. His soul, his soul is sold to Satan for fourpence because he just stole this from an, his employer. And this guy says, that's exactly what happened. Mm. I came in, that's exactly what mm. I'd experienced. Mm. I've never met this man, and that's what he said. And I would see enormous continuity between the way the Spirit moves in the gifts in the book of Acts and in 1 Corinthians and so on, and the way that he moves today and has done through church history. And in a sense, so the language of revelation, which I, I think can be, you can, you can use it in mm. a number of different ways. I think in a very narrow sense, um, I think we might affirm, no, the Holy Spirit doesn't reveal anything in the sense that he doesn't reveal new gospel right. content to right. us. And I'd absolutely want to affirm that. But does the Holy Spirit prompt or speak or guide or lead his people without directly quoting the Bible, mm. but instead actually prompt and challenge people to follow mm. up on within the parameters of biblical understanding and revelation but does he bring specific direction to people to say particular things to move to particular places to take the gospel in certain ways to know a particular thing about how much a shoemaker mm. stole that mm. weekend or whatever it may be and i think yes absolutely i think yeah. you see that throughout Acts. so that's the main the main thing is i think we're probably there's a terminological we could get stuck on the word revelation, yeah, but I yeah. think what that word means, I find me in the narrow sense, I don't think it continues, but in the broader sense, I definitely do. Um, but, and so that would be, for me, probably an important... Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I'm using that language deliberately, and that's I, I want to explore it. So like, I would have all kinds of questions about what you mean by the sufficiency of Scripture. So, um, so for example, like when the prophets speak in Antioch and say, send Bar Barnabas and Saul out for minister for the work I'd set them aside for, is like, are they bound by that prophecy? Is that prophecy, ob like, are they obligated by it? But I think well, the answer they, is yeah. They, like, ob they obey it clearly. I mean, but, it depends but, what you mean by obligated. Do you, so, so I mean, it, would they be sinning if they disobeyed yeah, it? Yeah. Yes, I think they would. Have. And, and, I, and I agree. So, um, and, and uh, the whole one, I'd say, needs to be alert in Acts, um, Acts thirteen. Actually, that that first missionary journey of Paul is is of epochal significance. It's it's fulfilling things in Isaiah in terms of Christ going as a light to the nations. Um, that that sending of of uh, Paul and Barnabas out is immensely significant for the early church and its understanding of, of who they are. Yeah. Um, and 
and, and that so that kind of prophecy like i mean so that that happened and yet when that kind of prophecy happens you're obligated the christian is obligated to listen to the prophet of god and the examples of things like spurgeon and stuff like i think like absolutely there's all kinds of like god works it moves in mysterious ways you know and but spurgeon was not encouraging people to pursue the gift of prophecy and, and he wasn't he wasn't saying this is a get that gift um, is is something that the New Testament church, that the current church needs to be exploring and pursuing. Mm. So, so th I think so that doesn't mean this, that doesn't. That's of course his interpretation. He when he he tells the story, it's fascinating yeah. because of course he fills it with allusions to biblical passages about the gift of prophecy. You know, yeah. come see a man who told me everything I ever did, which yeah. is a quote, obviously, what the yeah. woman at Samaria yeah. says about Jesus. So. Obviously, in his, I'm, I'm not for a moment saying Spurgeon was a charismatic in that sense. In some ways, what is the fact that he wasn't is an even stronger reason to see a connection because he's not trying to dress the story up. He's actually, in spite of the fact he doesn't think it's a gift for today, is saying, I, I felt moved by the Holy Spirit to say X, and it turned out to be completely true. And I think, so I'm not using, of course, I wouldn't use the language of obligation of anybody. I'm not saying that, that I would use that language myself either, never have. Until just now, but, but I think, but like I guess but, I, say, I think you, sh you ought to, as in pro prophetic. The but nature that's not what a charismatic believes prophetic ministry today is. You see, so I yeah, think, sure, and, sure. And, that's, and that's where that's where I think, as in that's where the disagreement lies. So, so, as in, like prophecy in the New Testament is obligatory. Like it, that's what the so prophecy throughout Scripture, when God speaks, His word binds you. It's not a kind of if if you if you. But I don't, I don't think that's true because I think although that's true in I think that's to be true in many ways in the in the Old Testament. I think yeah. you find the example in Corinth where people you are encouraged to weigh what is said. So, and so in that sense, the, the process is that of discernment of the extent to which yeah. this aligns with divine revelation and the extent to which it doesn't. And so when insofar as it aligns with divine revelation, you are obligated to obey it. Insofar as it doesn't, you're obliged, in fact, not to test everything, hold fast to the good, abstain from every form of evil. And I think that but that's in the sense that God has spoken, you are obligated to obey. But in the sense that He hasn't, you're not. And I think that would be so. That's that's that, this, that's the heart of the issue. So, so um, what, what? So you're, the idea that New Testament prophecy is not is not authoritative. Um, that somehow it, it it contains this mixture of good stuff and stuff that you can chuck away. Like exegetically, I think there's very very shaky foundations for arguing that. Um, I know it's, it rests on like one Thessalonians five and this idea of what the, the concept of weighing um, and the idea that Agabus in the Acts didn't, um, you know, his prof his predictions weren't true. I think all three of them are very, very shaky. If you think, if you look carefully, um, New Testament prophecy, the idea of evaluating or way the word is evaluating, isn't it? Um, you're you're they're being encouraged to listen to the prophet and to see is this man a true prophet or a false prophet. Um, the idea that um, that New Testament prophecy is some kind of watered down version of Old Testament prophecy, just it, I, I don't think is scripturally tenable. Um, like it, it so. I, th I guess I just said well, the basis for so Wayne, Wayne Grudem is the kind of guy who advocates it, isn't he? And that we've got these two tiers of prophecy: a watered, like a the full blown I, thing, I, and then I a watered I, down. I actually version. don't hold the same distinction as him because, okay. as you may know from the book, so in the Old Testament, I, I think the so we're going diving in deep here, right? Yeah, but that's the Old fine. Testament, that's what we're here for. In the Old Testament, prophetic language is uh, you get these examples of um, the prof the test of the infallible prophet, right? So you get that in Deuteronomy. But you have the word prophet, uh, words of like uh, about prophecy used of all kinds of other things, which are generally um, sort of rolled up together. On mm. so a charismatic would generally say there's all sorts of different things that prophets do and say. Sometimes you can, sometimes prophesying in Saul's case is like raving naked through the night, which of course I'm sure is what my meetings mm. would look like. <laughs> so I'm in a time where there are, as in to be prophesying might be ecstatic speech in, in a of number course. of texts and, in, yeah. and it might mean writing court history and it might mean leading people in worship and it might mean so i think the the sense of all prophecy in the old testament is infallible divine revelation and therefore it's the same in the new testament i'd say actually i don't even think it is in the old testament and certainly in the new testament you both of course you with, with continuity so this word is used with mm. some uh, variation in the way in which the language is used and that's of course why it's very important quick, quick response because we are already back okay. backing up against our, our the end of our first section um, are there any examples of prophecy in scripture that don't bind the per obligate the person like by, by its very yeah, nature all, Saul is it's all all night is raving naked prophesying there's no indication that anybody wrote anything oh, no, no, down, sure, no, let sure. alone but, that they but, felt but the gift, the, gift the gift of prophecy that you're encouraging churches to pursue in 1 Corinthians 14 is a gift of speech in which you speak the word of God to others. Sure. And, and that, that, that the, the idea that doesn't have authority just, just but, doesn't but, seem to be wrestling but with but what prophecy is. But is, then is, is, when we say we speak the word of God, we're not talking about the word of God as in what we've been revealed in scripture. This is obviously something, in your view, Andrew, which is to be tested and weighed and, yeah. and we're not, yeah. we, we have to work out if it is a In both Old and New Testaments, the, 
the idea that all prophetic speech is infallible divine revelation. I haven't used that language. So I'm not, no, I'm no, not no, arguing sure. that it's infallible. Right. Or, or, okay, or, authoritative. okay or in that case, all prophetic speech is authoritative such that you have to obey what is being said. I think in really? some cases. Like that's, so where, where are the, exa where are the examples of prophets? I've just quoted Saul twice. But, but like, Saul doesn't, Saul isn't, like, so Saul, Saul's in, engaged in ecstatic worship, but he's not, we, we've no idea that he says things to people that they say, okay, that doesn't matter. Like I'm not, like it yeah, seems. He is clearly, he's clearly, I'm, I'm not using this as the example of the kind of thing right. I yeah, yeah, practice. Yeah, I just yeah, want to use it as a, a clear Old Testament example, because yeah. I think in the New Testament, I think the case at Corinth to me is strong to make the same thing anyway. But I think in the Old Testament, you have it where you have somebody prophesying and not only is it not authoritative speech, it's not even speech that anybody writes down or tells you what was said, which means that the word prophecy doesn't necessarily connote what Simon says it does, we, which is that let's, of authoritative. Let's wind this one up here. I accept that you guys obviously have, you know, a strong disagreement on, on what prophecy is constituted, you know, when we when we perform it today mm. or, or in the, the, the New and Old Testament. Um we are going to move on um, to talk about tongues as well in the next section of the show. I've got a little clip from the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, because I think that's often it's it's helpful to, to zero in on mm. stuff that's going on in churches today and what, what sure. both your takes are on it. Yeah. I'd also be interested in, in opening up, you know, as, as well in this context, whether the Bible itself appears to affirm or contradict the idea that the gifts are supposed to be used in, in you know, yeah. uh, today. So um, we'll we'll keep going on this. Uh, we're talking about cessationism and the charismatic church. Our tongues, prophecy and charismatic gifts for today. My guests are Andrew Wilson and Simon Arscott here on Unbelievable. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter. Welcome back to the show. We're talking about uh, cessationism and the charismatic church. Uh, are the gifts of tongues, prophecy and uh, healing for today? Uh, we won't get to all of those, I'm sure, in the course of today's discussion. But I'm joined by my guests, Andrew Wilson and Simon Arscott. Uh, Andrew has a new book out. It's called Spirit and Sacrament, an Invitation to You Charismatic Worship. And uh, in that last section, we were kind of going over the, the ground of whether or not, uh, you know, we can tell from scripture that we've got everything we need and whether prophecy today is essentially adding or not to that. Obviously, lots lots more we could talk about on that. So why don't we just um, uh, hear a bit of what Justin Welby had to say on this very issue of tongues, uh, because I got to sit down with him recently and he told me about how it functions in his own prayer life. It's fair to say you, you've come from a reasonably charismatic background. Do, do you... What do you, how do you see that expressed in your own prayer life? Is that something where you, you see the... I love the phrase of reasonably. That's a really... Are you an Anglican? I'm not, no. Well, you sound like one. Well, when you say reasonably may, charismatic, maybe I'm, I'm that, that's, close that's, enough I really as, like that. I'm United Reformed Church, so maybe that's close oh, enough. Oh, yeah, that'll but, do. That'll do. <laughs> reasonably, char reasonably charismatic as opposed to unreasonably charismatic. <laughs> I just think that's great. Uh, well, in, uh, I hope... Uh, in my own prayer life, well, I mean, the obvious, I mean, the obvious thing is, is part of my daily prayer discipline is praying in tongues every day for a certain period. Mm. Um, and not as a sort of occasional thing, but as just part of daily prayer. Part of my daily prayer discipline is expecting to hear from God um, through people with words, knowledge or prophecies. And an awful lot of those come in and some, some of them are shall we say, we, I read them and think, hmm, I'm not entirely sure about that. And others, you think, oh, yes, I can sense something of mm. the Spirit of God in that. Mm. But these are, I think the danger with putting charismatic as a sort of tribal category within the church is, first of all, all Christians are filled with the Spirit. Mm. Paul is perfectly clear that, about that. Uh, in Romans. Secondly, um, so everyone is a charismatic, every Christian is a charismatic in one sense. Secondly, some of the things that historically charismatics are, you know, we do healing. Yeah, the church's always done healing. Mm. Uh, the charismatic and non-charismatic bits pray for healing, mm. anoint for healing, lay hands for healing. Um, so I'm cautious about turning it into a tribal thing. Absolutely. I mean, I can imagine, though, I mean, many Christians will have exactly the same experience and it'd be unremarkable speaking in tongues. Yeah, the, 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 I would say that for me. I mean, it's very seldom ecstatic. It is, but you can imagine some people who aren't familiar with that being, gosh, 
does the Archbishop of Canterbury pray in tongues? Um, but for you, it's, it's obviously not an issue. It's not, not something to... No, it's, yeah. it's not something to make a great song and dance about. Um, and um, given it's usually extremely early in the morning, <laughs> um, it's not usually an immensely ecstatic moment because I'm sort of uh, <laughs> struggling. So uh, just a clip from that interview with Justin Welby um, sp uh, on, on his own practice of, of speaking in tongues, which made, you know, a number of newspapers pick that up and uh, it was reported widely. Um, though, to some extent, his experience is the same as many, many other Christians, as I mentioned. The, the charismatic Pentecostal church, I think, is easily over half a billion people now in that tradition around the world. Um, but when it comes to speaking in tongues, I'll start perhaps with you on this one, Andrew. Have you done that yourself? Oh, yeah. Uh, and what's going on for you when that happens? So I think um, this is where, I, if using biblical categories to explain it, I'm not sure that this is always the same as the, you know, what's cognitively happening mm. when you first, I think I first spoke in languages when I was, I tend to say languages because it sounds less. It took me a long time to realize that over a thousand tongues to sing didn't mean over a thousand red muscles in your mouth. I thought, I, I thought it well, was, that's new I, on me as well. So, I didn't realize so, it didn't mean so languages, the, so I, I've just the penny that, has just dropped for me as well. So, <laughs> so that, don't done. feel bad. So I tend to use languages way. just to avoid confusion. But um, I probably first did, did that when I was thirteen or fourteen, and I don't know that I understood all the arguments from one Corinthians when I did. But so, so to me, I think this is where where Paul is describing the practice of the church together, and he says you. If you speak in languages, you build up yourself. And the reason why you should prophesy in the congregation rather than speaking in languages without interpreting it is because prophecy edifies others, whereas the gift of languages edifies yourself. And then he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Um, but I'd rather in the church speak prophetically than mm -hmm. 10,000 words in a language. And I think that to me is just a really helpful framework. There's, he says lots of other things there, but a, a very helpful framework for thinking this is a spiritual gift that is pr actually primarily given in, in the Corinthian sense, obviously there's the day of Pentecost version, if you mm. like, but in the Corinthian sense, and what Paul is saying in his own practice is something he does on his own. This is not something he does to preach the gospel to people who don't speak the same language as him, as it happens in the book of Acts. It might be manifest that way today, and it uh, and it's often does, but in my case, it, that's not been the gift at all. It's mm -hmm. been that of effectively edifying yourself by in and through prayer. Uh, in and the I process, know this often is probably used in private. difficult yeah. to put into words exactly, but what, what what's happening to you or in your spirit or whatever um when when you speak in la those kind of private prayer languages almost um what what what's kind of happening so i think at that a, point? a mixture of 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 joy of of prayer you basically paul also uses it gives important directions on it so it says i will pray with my spirit but i'll also pray with my mind so what mm. happens is as you're as i'm vocalizing and speaking in languages i'm also mm. my mind is meditating on biblical truths but i'm articulating often things in effect, to be that what I but obviously I regard it as a spiritual language mm. without necessarily using words which have meanings in another language, but I'm using my mind to reflect on the truths about which I'm praying. Um, and that brings a certain sense of joy. I think the analogy I like that Terry Virgo uses is said it's like when you, when you turn on the shower and you have to. It's sort of running cold for the first mm. minute or so, and then it eventually runs hot. And I find something, which is, I think is what Justin's saying in that clip, that at a pra that's not a biblical observation, yeah. it's just a practical one. I think it happens in prayer in English yeah. as well sometimes, actually, that you end up re saying something and praying it, and it doesn't feel true as, as right. you begin to speak. But I think that, to be honest, can happen in prayer in any right. language. But that's certainly what happens often for I, me in languages. I've heard well. other people who have spoken of their, their use of the um, praying in tongues uh, saying it's almost like a for them a shortcut almost to coming into the presence of God in some sort of way that sort of resets their mind. It, it kind of gives them a, a, a sort of access in a way that perhaps just yeah, I suppose I don't, I don't having think to I would use really, the, the kind of... I don't experientially argue for it or no. even think about it in that way. I And I think I put, what will often happen is in, a, in sort of in a prayer context where I'm pr interceding for something, well, I will often have it feel like I've run out of English words and I worry that I'm repeating myself in English. I will mm. often then pray in languages for a bit while continually reflect and ask, right. I'm asking God and I will actually blend in and out of them. Again, I'm not that practice. I don't yeah, think yeah. it's, I'm not saying it's, I don't think it's biblical or non-biblical. I just think it probably, Paul doesn't elaborate really on how it works much of the time. But I think in that, in 1 Corinthians 14 in particular, he gives quite extended guidance about how to use the gift wisely. And so that's what mm. I've attempted to do and that's mm. the way it would basically, which I think overlaps with what Justin was saying in that interview. Now, Simon, I know despite your significant disagreements with, with Andrew on this subject, you've mm. got a great deal of respect for his scholarship and oh, know, yeah, yeah. theology and everything else. But do you think he's just mistaken when he's speak, you know, praying in this way that, that 
something else is actually happening? Um, I suppose. I guess I must do. As in, yeah, I, I don't. I, I must. <laughs> I would assume. Yeah, <laughs> what sort of disagreement <laughs> yeah, is, isn't it? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, though it's not in one sense. I don't. I don't feel there's, there's as much at stake in the issue in the life of a church. And you know, as in, if people uh, privately pray in tongues, it doesn't. It's not going to affect the life of a congregation in quite the same way. I mean, I can understand you'd say, "Oh, you're 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 missing the gifts that are there." Um, I suppose, like, I I can't quite tell what to make of tongues because Acts two is different to one Corinthians fourteen, or they seem to be slightly different things going on. Just um, just for those who aren't immediately familiar with what you're saying, so, there. so when the gift yeah. of um, languages tongues descends on uh, the disciples yeah, uh, yeah. on the day of Pentecost and they yeah. speak in other languages that's and right. that forms the basis of many people coming into the, the early yeah. church that's different to what Paul describes in terms of um, him speaking it, in, in tongues a great it seems deal to in, be yeah I mean I, 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 I don't know if you'd agree with that I, I, would, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think would. it seems to be though, though I guess I'd probably want to argue there's a bit of a commonality as well though which I mean obviously at the level of their both tongues um, that I, I think that they're, they're miraculous. I mean, it's interesting. I, I wouldn't want to play down like they're just an or, or it's just ordinary or mundane. Like it's they're. they're a, so you wouldn't quite agree with what Justin Welby no, says. No, I wouldn't. About yeah, I mean, certainly of, my observation this is just a kind of yeah. it's like brushing my teeth in the morning. Or something, yeah, my observation yeah. is that no, this I, is. I wouldn't agree. Okay, with okay. Yeah, and no, he I, didn't I, say that to be no, fair no, to him. But, but, <laughs> but no, but it's, 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 it's a miraculous. <laughs> you put words in the Archbishop's mouth. You're going to get back in the Guardian, aren't you? It's 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 the gifts the gift of tongues. It's clearly a miraculous gift. It's it's supernatural. You know, supernatural. It's not just something that that's humanly generated. Right. Um, it's also got a huge sign function. So I think it's a lot about, again, the church, the Jewish church breaking out to the nations. Acts 2, that's clearly what's going on. 1 Corinthians 14, that's there as well. Paul specifically says tongues are a sign for unbelievers. And he references some stuff in Isaiah to do with the Jews going into exile and being spoken to in other languages. So so I think that's an important feature of what I see going on there too. And so that's, that's what, I mean, it's all tongues and prophecy are, like when tongues are translated in 1 Corinthians 14, they're equivalent to prophecy. And so that's why I'd argue that they're, they're no longer around um, today, just for the same reason that I don't think prophecy is. Yeah. Andrew? Yeah I, don't, yeah, I don't agree that they are equivalent to prophecy in that sense. I think tongues, he uses the language of prophecy, use the language of speech. He does occasionally use the language of, obviously, a revelation, whereas with tongues, he uses the language of prayer, uh, or even if I will sing with my spirit or I will sing with my mind. So I think the idea that this is... I think, I don't want I'm, some charismatics, of course, have gone the other way and said actually all tongue speaking is vertical to God mm. rather than horizontal. I wouldn't mm. quite go that far, mm. um, but and, I don't and, think and the idea. Even, that, I don't think tongue speaking is horizontal in the sense right. that I'm speaking to try and instruct you on behalf of God. That actually Paul's language of it this this is a language I use for prayer and for song and for worship, which is if primarily going upwards. I wouldn't want to constrain it and therefore say it can't have any relevance to people horizontally but right. i think that's the way that paul speaks about it so I there think is, there is so you don't think that when it's interpreted it has the same status as prophecy in one Corinthians 14 i just don't think it's the same sort of thing i think it's this equivalent of me praying it so if i was to the analogy i'd use and of course i've, I've seen this happen is where you have uh somebody speaks in languages and is praying in a and what in one case i was you know in a couple of years ago praying in a tribal language is a white girl playing praying in a tribal language that a nearby girl in the meeting hears and understands how do you know know to speak my tribal language it's an african language and, and she said i've never learned to speak right. it at all but so i think that kind of thing happens but in the sense so to translate it but she's not necessarily therefore prophesying if she was to translate it what she'd be doing is explaining the meaning of the prayer that she just offered up and i think paul's concern is less to do with making sure everybody hears what the word of the lord through that language is but rather to make sure that you don't have someone babbling in a language no one understands and not being edified by it because it's effective like it might be the equivalent of translating a prayer from another language for instance so in, in your local church setting let's say mm. andrew um say that tongues is manifesting in a service that there's things um you know people are you know when you say the phrase tongues is manifesting it instantly <laughs> sounds it, bizarre it, it, it <laughs> makes it sound like there's demonic activity i sorry bad choice but, of you words. know i know what but, you mean yeah. but um say let's say people are singing in tongues you mm. know um, as, as they're worshiping that none of that particularly needs anyone to, to stand up and say i have an interpretation for that oh no I, that's not what i'm saying at all no, I, th no. I think when when languages are used in the corp in the corporate setting, they should be interpreted, which I think Paul is very clear about. What I think, what I'm denying is that the fact that they need to be interpreted means that they function as prophecy, as prophecy from as God to us, as right. opposed to okay. primarily prayer and song, which but is the way Paul talks about them. But if, if it is happening in that corporate setting, people should be on hand to say, I believe this is yeah, what I, God I do. is presumably, meaning. Presumably, if it's a gift, though, that the, the, the speech is miracle like it has a miraculous there's a there's a sure. so the status of the again that speech is not just like when you've translated it it might be a prayer but it still has a kind of revelatory value the, if you the nature of the gift is that it's it's from the spirit it's not something that that 
you know, my prayers, I mean, my, I mean although I take for granted, there's a, a valid point that the Holy Spirit inspires all prayer fundamentally. Yeah. I think that's but, all, that's all I'm, I would, I would in fact, in that sense say, if any prayer prompted and given unction by the Spirit in English, the, I, and this is again back to the point we we're making before about you see I think your your use and my use of revelation are probably slightly one of them I'm not sure which is broader or narrow but I think <laughs> you're using the word revelation in a way that ties it specifically to the the word of God such as could almost be added to the canon or something and I don't use the word that way and so I don't regard my prayers which are spirit prompted as being of revelation in the sense that you know the book of james is revelation but i nevertheless believe that it is spirit prompted and so in that sense i'd say the same about languages as i would about prophecy and you would say your english prayers are in that sense spirit prompted animated or prompted or provoked as in at all so, you, one yeah. cannot pray to god the father through the son without the spirit um, mm -hmm. generating that as in all that that's what it means to, to be in fellowship so with god. i think to interpret in that sense a language in in the sense of speaking in tongues is actually not at all dissimilar to what would happen if i was in a french speaking service and, and i have done of course and someone leans over and explains to me what's being said in french and, and translates it that doesn't mean it's got I, revelatory content but i still it i feel like i wouldn't some... understand it if they didn't well, to me, it's, I'm still a bit puzzled by, again, the, fun, the, the, the miraculous nature of the gift, which is just of, seems to be very obviously there on the surface. I'm not quite sure what that's doing then. If, 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 it's, if it's just, if the, equivalent, the prayer is just the equivalent of a prayer I pray in English, yeah, uh, it, it feels like it's supposed to function in some kind of prophetic yeah, way. Like there's an uh, there's an extra there's an extra here. The spirit is giving some extras, extras in tongues, extras in prophecy, and and that's that's the. That's the I think if the word. I may be misunderstanding what you're saying about extras, yeah. but I think because in the first segment you were talking about, you know, we don't need any extras. Mm. But I presume you don't take that to mean that you don't need any miracles. So you can think God can still work miracles, right? Absolutely. So, 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 so what does it mean for you then to be for a miracle, something to be miraculous, but not revelatory, which is all I'm saying tongues is. I assume you believe that category exists. I'm just applying it to this gift as you well. You assume, I believe, which category exists, sorry. That it is possible for a gift to be miraculous, but not necessarily revelatory in the sense you mean it, as in yeah, possible yeah, capable of being added. So I'm just saying, I think language is like that. There's no problem for me with something being miraculous, but not revelatory speech that must be okay. transcribed and taken at the same weight as biblical okay. i mean let, let's talk about you know the, the, the use and misuse um because they're probably a, a level of agreement <laughs> between you both i think um, simon might win this round <laughs> <laughs> what are your concerns simon about what 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 might happen and you do see happening in certain parts yeah. of the charismatic church when it comes to either prophecy tongues um or any other aspect of, of what we call the, the charismatic gifts of the spirit uh so, I, I mean, speaking very generally, isn't it? As an, I think a, a lot of the charismatic impulse that I see in people has a, a very healthy um, concern. It's a concern with, with dead formalism. It's a concern with, with dullness. You know, you, look, you sit with the Bible and you're just feeling... Uh. Mm. And, and so there's a, there's, we, need more, like, we need more than this. You're like, and we can't be satisfied with that. The gospel's better than this. I, I, my concern is that it's providing a wrong answer to a right question and what do we do like when i'm feeling dull and empty and dry spiritually where do i turn what do i need i need jesus christ pointed out to me in the power of the spirit through his word i don't need the spirit to give me extras i don't need extra revelation i need sad deep satisfaction in this alone and so my, con my concern is that um the, it's not so much with um anything to do with the feelings or the form it's th this is that the very I mean, I'm still. I feel like I, I need to do some more talking to understand precisely what, mm. what you're saying. But in a in a general sense of the charismatic movement, it's opening the door to extra. That the voice of God in the life of the church is not is is or the scriptures are insufficient to know the will of God for your life. If you want, like, if I want to know how do I live for God's glory in the in the 21st century in London today, where do I turn? And I want to say with conviction, it's. This is everything you, with the power of the Spirit, this book, and, as and, you apply and it and unpack it, gives without you Without putting words in your mouth, yeah. is your concern that people start to look for and chase that experience, that kind of, that I think that so, so, so I suppose ultimately, over and above, you but, know, the, 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 yeah. the core? Yeah, you know, I, th I think it can do. I think it, I mean, I would, I, I think that the position ultimately is in danger of detracting from Christ. So Christ is a prophet, a priest and a king. Okay, Christ is king today. Yeah? He, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. He doesn't need his kingship increasing. Like he's king. His kingship just needs applying. Yeah? We, we want Christ's kingship to be recognized among the nations. Um, Christ is priest. His sacrifice is finished. Doesn't need anything adding to it. His priestly work of sacrifice just needs applying. Christ is prophet. 
He has fully revealed God. Mm. We don't need any extras. It just needs that revelation applied. And that's, and I, I guess the, the, yeah, the, the sad thing is I meet many, many Christians who, yeah, for, for whom the new, that the speech of God today outside of scripture is what excites them more, is what, and I think just inevitably, as soon as you have that ex, the room for the extra, you no longer think this is sufficient. I, I think it, there is a, it's a simple, through what door does the living God speak to me? I want to say, like the spirit is speaking through this door. If there are some other doors over here where some extra stuff can creep in, I'm going to pay less attention to this inevitably because I've got to look at two places. And I want to say as a minister to, to, my, to my church, to people, you know, as I'm evangelizing, like this is the, like Christ and his revelation through the apostles is sufficient. That's where you go. Mm. So now I know, I know you lot, you've symbolized with an awful lot of mm. that, but I do, I think the opening up of the extra, um, because prophecy is, there's stuff in prophecy that isn't, in here or derivable from here it's new that's that's by definition what you're saying that's th therefore it's insufficient like therefore i feel you're it seems to be inconsistent with the sufficiency of scripture i mean we we won't go over the, the issue of whether or not prophecy quite functions in that way again but I, I guess you can agree that there are obviously instances in which people go off you know say oh, yeah. off in yeah. you know all, all the, kinds all, of directions all that the time not... and, and that actually so to me is is a really important argument for <clears> biblically <throat> teaching through mm. You know, not that they're the only chapters in the Bible, but 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, which in a charismatic context is something, you know, I mean, in fact, we just did a series on the nature of being filled and receiving the Holy Spirit in this last month. Um, and we do four Sundays teaching that through and probably were, Simon, to have heard it, have agreed with almost all mm. of it. And I think we're trying to guide and lead people in that. But I think the key thing when it comes to the potential conflict which I think Simon sees and I don't between the sufficiency of Scripture and the gift. I would never use the word extra, you see, because I, I'm, I'm like you're not sure what I mean. I think I'm not quite sure what you mean. I, I yeah. can't tell whether you mean miraculous something, in which case then is a healing an extra, and I presume not, or is it any miracle is an extra? I think no, no. I just don't think the Bible's like that. So, so as I'm reading Scripture, I'm seeing it full of exhortations to pursue these very gifts. So where I where I would go, of course, the positive. I'm making at the moment making a bit of a defensive case. Mm. Like, how would I mm. defend yeah. this or that? But I think the positive case is to go and say the very Bible which I regard as sufficient for salvation is the the Bible which says eagerly desire to prophesy, eagerly desire pursue. If anybody has a gift, let them use them. If it is prophecy in proportion to your faith. Whole so I think I've got five or six texts where Paul exhorts his churches to pursue the gift mm. and then gives them a lot of clarity about how you should exercise those gifts without being. Food foolish or without getting sidetracked. I share exactly that concern pastorally. There's plenty of people who get distracted, which to be honest, I don't think is unique to the charismatic and, church. And I think you can get that yeah. in the Roman Catholic church. Uh, every, you can get it in probably Presbyterian Every, every church well. has its, has its excesses. So I think the point is, I think to say, I think that might open another door. I'd say, well, to be honest, that danger is always at risk, unless the only thing you ever do as a Christian is read the Bible, which is, isn't true for none of us. There's always a risk of that. So what I think you need, rather than no, we don't do that, is to say, here's how we practice this biblically and wisely in such a way that leads us to Jesus. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. This, that's what Paul, of course, does. And so he uses his teaching on prophecy and languages in order to draw people towards Christ. And that's what I would try and do as well. So, so just help me out in terms of understanding what you're saying. So when prophecy happens in your church, what, what what, what what status does it have? Like what what? And give us an example, actually, because mm, I'm sure you must have some of, of where you believe there has been a, a genuine, if you like. Okay, so an example that was that for example. me was very, um, you know, very personally helpful. And this is so this is exactly where the role of discernment, I think, comes. You're effectively you're testing, right. aren't you? You're weighing. So I'm in a meeting um, with a group of other pastors, sort of forty or fifty pastors at a, at a gathering. I just use this because it's a particularly good example in my own life. Okay, and uh, a guy who is. Um, recognize in our context as having a strong prophetic gift like strong prophetic ministry not just a, like any old person as it okay. happens somebody else has preached and it's opened the, up the word he gets up and begins speaking prophetically to people and he moves points at one person in the room and says there's a um, what I think there's a Macedonian court in your life I think you're going to need to get ready to move I think the Lord is going to get you to a place where you're going to need to move town somewhere else and unbeknown to the prophet but or if you want to call him that which I do um, but known, obviously, to this guy a month before he had been in another meeting where another prophetic person used the exact phrase, a Macedonian calling your life, and he ends, and he actually moved as a result and is still leading a church in that town now. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you've got to move west and, all that. and that's what he did. He then, the next, the next person, he goes around in a room full of pastors and says, you, I believe the Lord is saying that you have been disappointed in your romantic relationships this last summer. And that's a pretty of a long yeah, shot in that's a pastor's a pretty room, specific, but it turns yeah. out that this guy had been engaged and his engagement had broken up over that summer 
And as a result, he's just burst into tears, of course, as he mm. would, and people are going around and pray for him. And then he turns to me and he says, I can see manuscripts. I'm 25. No, I mean, nobody. I'm not even started uh, 25, maybe 26. You probably hadn't even, even been an unbelievable. I hadn't even been an unbelievable. But but interesting connection. <laughs> this is how I first end up on your show. Okay. Because he then brings this prophetic word and he said, I see manuscripts of your life. He said, an editor is going to approach you and you should write the book that is in your heart to write. And he'd had no way of knowing. No, I hadn't even told my the rest of my team. He didn't that, know you not particularly at all, well no. at this point. No. But that morning, I'd had an email from an editor saying, I've seen that article you wrote, Deluded by Dawkins, on your website, mm. and we'd like to publish it as a book. And then he goes on, and I, to be honest, after that, you're just right. so wowed yeah. by the whole thing, you just don't notice what the rest of the stuff is going on, and lots of prayer. Now, I'm not, I'm telling, it's a good story, because right. there's three absolutely bang on, and I'm certainly not saying that that's always what happens, because sure. Simon and I both know it's not, and so do you. But what I'm saying is that what happens when that is said is that's not to say every single thing you said is infallibly true. Um, but it, or, and I know that's not the word you, or even, or even that I feel necessarily that I am bound to obey everything you just said mm. because you were accurate in the bits that I know about. Mm. But it is to say that I think in as much as, which is why, you know, would use examples of, you know, Agabus and the Spirit speaking in, in the book of Acts, in as much as God has spoken, I obviously receive and just see the wisdom and love and care of God for me in revealing those things. And it just, God really knows me really well. That's wonderful. He's interested in those sorts of details in our lives. But in as much as he, there, some of that is, I think, insight from God, but probably it's all mediated mm. through the personality and opinions and it might of the person. And if I was to listen to recording now, it may well be that one or two things he said were slightly off. And but, I'd go, but, and well, if, that's okay and if he because said, I'm weighing I, it and discerning. Uh, God is telling me that you're supposed to leave your wife and children, Andrew. And, well, and which then, is obviously Then, then yeah. you simply say, well, yeah. I know that. Now, and obviously there's plenty the of those. Th if yeah. that happens, it's easy. I think the situation that we probably all concede is much harder is when you don't know if it's right, right. or not. Yeah. And yeah. that's where I think weighing and discerning is needed and wisdom and processing through with leaders and uh, and you know prayer and talking to your family about it and all those and uh, and sometimes words are of course are of that category the ones which are obviously right or obviously wrong aren't that sure. difficult it's the ones which are in the middle of so for, I mean so I know you might you might say this, this never happens but I'm just interested as to what you would do like so if someone prophesies Mary should marry Bob like yeah, how how, yeah, how do you evaluate so, that yeah so I in our movement of churches we have and I think a lot of I don't know, I'm going to use the word responsible charismatics, which may be an oxymoron, <laughs> word, as in, but you would strongly discourage words of but, that form, but, which but is that's... not to say that they cannot ever be right. But, it, but what the advice I've often given is that I think the, the, the larger the life change that a person would have to make in response to any divine direction, and this, by the way, is true whether you believe in prophecy or not, mm. because, of course, Hudson, how did Hudson Taylor know he's right that he's supposed to go to China? Like, you, it's not only people who believe in the gift of prophecy who do this. Actually, we all... you. In fact, nearly said it in the conversation we had before. Like, yeah. felt led of God. People, we, we all do that. Of course we do. Yeah, so, sure. so how do you know? And of course, my tests are the same as the tests that you would use. And in that sense, you are basically weighing it in a very, very similar way. The and therefore, you wouldn't have, if, you, if a word like that came in and you said, if the higher the bar needed for me to change my life, the higher the bar of proof, if you can call it that, or of wisdom or evidence or whatever that would need to be cleared for me to believe it was the right thing to do it still seems quite like interesting that you can as a movement decide that this we're not receiving prophecies like this like if it's from god if it's from god like who, it's, it's not an quite the same as saying you're not receiving it i think it's the saying that the bar goes up the larger the the larger the amount i mean and by the way i don't want to represent a whole movement yeah, sure, there no, would yeah, be others sure, who wouldn't yeah, yeah. um but I, effectively it's a burden of proof thing that the burden of proof has to be higher to say you need to marry that you know that that's a there are, I, i've got friends who would say that's what happened but that, not necessarily even through prophetic ministry some i've got friends who are conservatives who would say i really felt god leading me to this place so but i think you would also rightly say whether you're a conservative a cessationist a charismatic you would always say do you know what you want to test that more because that's a big big bar to but clear i guess how do you how does one test that that's so if when something is beside scripture when it's mm. not contained revealed yeah. in it how do you test it in the sense of like I think in the same way as you, but I think in the same way as you would. I think if you had somebody in your church who came up and said, "I really want to," I'm a, you know, my dad of three, I'm married. I really want to throw in my career as a banker and become an actor. Sure, yeah. How would you? And and I feel like God's leading me in that direction, but yeah. he doesn't use any language of prophecy. I think you'd counsel him in the same way I would. I think you would. I think you would say, "Wow, there's a lot to think about there." And how's your wife feel about but then, it? And so, you, so, so are you what, sure this is your gift? And are you sure? How does yeah. the history of your life tie in with it? But you what do those? So I get it. But it's, at that point, it's like what? That's that's not what New Testament prophecy is. Like, is in Agabus so how would you evaluate Agabus saying just for those who haven't quite clued in on okay, the Agabus sorry. thing because because yeah. you guys are, uh, just just give us the context so, of that. This yeah. is, this Agabus is, is, a, is a prophet in the in the book of Acts who there's a number of like, two or three prophecies that he gives one of them is that there's going to be a famine you know c coming and he reports that to the churches doesn't he and um like how uh, 
how does one evaluate something that is extra to scripture like it, mm -hmm. it it's the the pro prophecy is the word of god like it, it, it this whole idea that there's a, a kind of prophecy that doesn't obligate it's not the prophecy is god speaking it's god telling us things and when he tells us things we're obliged well, this, to and this obey is in the first and, segment exactly yeah. what i'm trying to say is not always true because i think that that isn't always true i think prophecy can mean that in the it can mean thus saith the lord but it can mean a great many other things in the old in the old testament let alone in the new where i think in the new testament in the example we were briefly discussing before um which we haven't i don't not on the recording but um where you ha where you have agabus giving a word about you the jews are going to bind this guy and actually in the end it's the romans so who this bind is him. when so agabus is speaking to in Paul, acts 21 yeah and he's prophesying that the jews will bind you if you go to jerusalem but it's actually the romans who do bind him now you i think and i'm sure simon would agree that's a very small distinction but the reality is nevertheless that the thing that the prophet said as revealed from god and the th and prompted by the spirit of god mm. and the thing that actually happened in the detail was slightly of it different was slightly different so, and, but, but and I, I think that's fine because yeah. i think you are basically there is always a component of divine revelation but, insight and a component of human interpretation which might be wrong and so, often is yeah i'll just be very uncomfortable with calling what agabus said there erroneous I, I, as in i know you didn't use that word but in terms of I, you seem to be saying that somehow he's got it wrong and I, as in what he's saying there is what happened now prophetic language obviously comes with metaphor like as in um, but i, I wouldn't want to attribute the, the this sort of idea of a discrepancy to, to Agabus, like that's the nature of the prophetic word. Like Old Testament scripture functions like that. Um, it's not inconsistent. So just a few verses earlier in Acts 21, 4, we have, you know, through the spirit, they were urging Paul not to go to Jerusalem. And Paul basically goes, that's not what, I know you're speaking through the mm. spirit, but actually your application of what you're telling me to do is incorrect. Th in inter words, though there interestingly, is, in so that, that's, there is a distinction that's between- weighing Yeah, effectively, that's I think so. I mean, obviously he doesn't use that word there, yeah. but I think we're assuming and, that there is a difference between what the spirit has revealed and what the, person speaking through the spirit even if you don't want to call them a prophet in that text is saying yeah. and that's exactly the distinction i'm arguing no, no but as in, in that just for example like in that earlier verse like the language of prophet isn't used now i, I just when it I, so i agree that the word prophecy gets used in different ways in scripture i agree that paul is saul, what saul the king is described as doing is that he's prophesying so it can describe an ecstatic kind of um, experience um, but there are, I don't think there are examples of people speaking prophetic words that don't obligate the person. So the idea that um, consistently the, the prophecy throughout scripture is somewhat is when they speak on behalf of God to God's people, you're obliged to do what they say. The idea that in a, the 1 Corinthians 14, that evaluation somehow says, no, now suddenly it's changed. Um, now suddenly- That's the thing, I don't think it's suddenly. So, yeah, so you're saying it's always, so it's always been the case that there are these two, no, two think, tiers of prophecy? No, no, I wouldn't use tiers at all. I would just say it's always been the case that the, the tight definition of prophecy that you would get from Deuteronomy 18, yeah. as in basically, which is of course a messianic text, isn't it? It's, yeah. you, there is gonna be a prophet who's gonna rise up among your brothers and he's gonna say these things and you should follow him. And if it's this kind of guy who gets you to worship other gods, you should ignore everything he says and you should kill him, by the way, which I don't think either of us are suggesting for <laughs> prophets today. Um, and th but th that divide between prophets who speak infallibly, thus says the Lord, or authoritatively in your terms, or obligatorily, if that's a word, Justin, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I don't and, know. <laughs> and all other prophets, I don't think that distinction is, is the only the distinction to be made. I think there's prophecy is, we're back where we okay, started, we, but we, there's we, a lot we of have, we have come back to this. and New Let, Testaments. We're gonna go to our final break. Okay. We're a little over time, in fact. So um, we're gonna have to keep the next section short, but um, I want to come back and we'll continue discussing tongues, prophecy, the charismatic gifts, are they for today? That's our discussion topic on Unbelievable. My guests are Andrew Wilson and Simon Arscott. If you listen to Unbelievable with Justin Briley on Premier Christian Radio and enjoy the conversations between Christians and skeptics, then this is the perfect app for you. For the latest updates, podcasts, videos, articles, bonus content, and much more, download the Premier Unbelievable app today. Welcome back to the final part of today's show. I'm Justin Briley, and today we've been asking our tongues, prophecy, and charismatic gifts for today. My guests, Andrew Wilson and Simon Arscott. Uh, Andrew's new book is Spirit and Sacrament, an invitation to you charismatic worship. Uh, I'll make sure there are links from today's show and indeed to where you can find out more about Simon and uh, his work with uh, Ilford Presbyterian Church. It's actually called All Nations Church, I think, isn't it, Simon? So um, it's been really interesting discussion. So much stuff that it would have been great to unpack further. I always never have enough time on this show. But um, I, I suppose on a practical level, one, one question I would have for you, Andrew, is um, given that we do all know of when things do go off the rails and people start claiming this, that and the other, and, uh, and, and there's a lot of abuse of, of the charismatic gifts in that way, how do we ensure that if your church does move in that way, that it doesn't fall into those traps, uh, you know, 
false doctrine, very subjective opinions suddenly becoming this this mm. is what God has for your life and 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 even disorder, you know, I think a lot of people are, are concerned at seeing, you know, some of those things you yeah. see on YouTube where it just looks like everything's gone crazy and yeah. and and it's no wonder then that people like John MacArthur and others mm. and Simon, you know, say that can't be that can't yeah. be the church. That that's yeah. definitely not what, what, what Paul was intending. Yeah. So I I, I think the answer is, of course, you know, which what you'd expect me to say, I suppose, which is that we practice the gifts according to biblical parameters, and we because I think it's the sufficient word of God that Simon and I and you treasure and love. That is that is that is the word that directs us to eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy, and then to do it in the following ways and mindful of those things. And um, and it, so in a, in a the lovely thing about it is when you read the Bible, the passages which are most championing. The need, the need for the church to pursue the charismatic gifts are also the passages that are the most careful at stipulating all the things you must make sure you do and don't do when you practice them. Mm-hmm. So it's not like you have some biblical writers who are saying, pursue spiritual gifts, go, 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 and then with no constraint. And then other guys go, man, these, this is a bit of a pig's ear. You don't have to so go it's there. evident even that back then in the early church, there yeah, were people who immediately coming started out yeah. doing things that were evidently not. Well, not and the Corinthians are the, the original charismatics yeah. and they're a, a basket case in so many <laughs> ways, aren't they? And that's what we love about them. That's why I did my PhD on them because they are just such an interesting example of that phenomenon but what's encouraging about that is it's not even like you know some doctrines where you would say well paul in romans is very good at securing people in their futures faith hebrews is very warningy and you've got to find a tension between two different Mm -hmm. writers um it's not but that's not what's going on in 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 Paul, what you have in Paul is at the points where he's most urging people to pursue the gifts. Go. If you have gifts, pursue them. Eagerly desire. Pursue, you know, zelute, like run after, seek after. Mm. That's also the exact same text where he says, and make sure you do it like this, 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 and this. Don't allow that. Only two or three people mm. doing it like this and in this way. And it's got to point to Jesus. And if you don't do that, and it's got mm. to be motivated by love, like the one, the wedding chapter, yeah. you know. That's if I speak in the tongue of yeah. men and of angels and have not love, you think that's not wasn't a wedding fodder homily initially. That was a, a way of saying this is how you should be charismatic. This is what you it's should all use about, the gifts this way. Yeah. So I think in, in a way, the lovely thing about it is that the texts that tell me to pursue the gifts, which I do wholeheartedly, are the very same texts that tell me these are all the things you've got to be careful you do and don't do when you're pursuing them. Otherwise, you'll get led into lunacy. Um, having said all that, I, I know um, that there are plenty of Christians who are in principle <laughs> fine with the idea of you know the gifts um prophecy tongues healing but never actually happens in practice in their local church uh, and they're not exactly you couldn't accuse them of eagerly pursuing these gifts what what's your advice for someone who's kind of says i i believe you andrew it's just the practice doesn't look anything like that in my I, situation I, to be honest i would concede it i i would i would admit it i don't think i will try and defend uh every if this is what you're asking i wouldn't try and defend every or even perhaps even most i haven't been to enough to know but every example of charismatic worship and say oh don't worry the good outweighs the bad right. because i suspect sometimes that's not true and i'm in fact i'm certain that sometimes it's not true but, but what i'm in, really referring to is is the person who says i, I in principle believe that god does speak through oh i see tongues, right okay but um we've never it never happens in my church and i to be honest, wouldn't know where to begin anyway. Oh, uh, okay, yes. Um, I mean, do you is, do you think Paul's injunction to eagerly pursue applies to that person? It, oh, every, abs- everyone yes. should be eagerly pursuing. I do. Pursuing I do. And gifts. in fact, I think this is probably an, an amusing way in which Simon and I might disagree at the very <laughs> uh, might agree at the very end of this okay. conversation, which is that the one position you can't really hold, in my view, is that the gifts are for today, but you shouldn't pursue them. And so I think I effectively I disagree with Simon, and he disagrees with me. But I'd go there's a great consistency agree, and integrity yeah, yeah. to yeah. saying the gifts of effectively those gifts not all of them but those gifts have ceased and we shouldn't pursue them i think there's consistency and integrity to saying they know they have they continue and you should pursue them but to say i think they're still around but i'm not going to do anything about that i think that's the one position you that, really that's can't the, hold. The, the one illogical position um okay um what about the person who is committed to the cessationist view as you are simon but it can lead you know sometimes to a kind of dead formalism uh, tra- tradition um I think that's where people I've met who have become Christians, especially through a charismatic experience, have mm. said, well, I grew up in this church or yeah, that church. Yeah. It never meant anything to me until yeah. I yeah. got zapped by the Holy Spirit and something amazing mm. happened. It all fell into place. And now mm. I'm, you know, there was this joy that I'd never experienced. Mm. And it's hard to, at some level, deny that person's yeah, yeah. experience that brought them to that yeah, position. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's that's sometimes the feeling is yeah. if you haven't got the charismatic kind of element, you're, you're, you're in danger of running into this, this yeah. dead form of religion. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, 
you know, there is lots of dead religion around in the name of Christianity. Um, I actually don't think it's cessationist. I, I, don't, I, I wouldn't think that's a label they'd use to describe themselves. And actually, interestingly, in some, in the more kind of liberal wings of the church, they're very alert to, the, to God speaking today. The, the, the large sections of the mainstream church are, are keen to hear the Spirit speaking today, not in a charismatic sense, but in a sense that, that this book isn't sufficient. We, we want more. So, As in, um, oh, well, that may have been what they thought back then, but yeah, now we know. Yeah, we, we need to listen fine. to the Spirit okay. today and, and right. what, what he said back then is developing. And that's a very, so, so actually, I don't think there are loads of churches that in a kind of, um, in a thoughtful sort of understanding of the sense of the term would call themselves cessationists. But, but like, so, so I'm unconvinced that cessationism sort of leads towards formalism, but do I, um, does every Christian face the danger of that? Like, absolutely, people, in my, if you are cessationist, there's a danger that you um, simply think that by reading the Bible and by learning lots about the Bible and filling your head with doctrine, you've grown in godliness, you've come to, you know, you're getting to know God. Um, so so I've, I'm very alert and want to kind of take seriously the de the, the danger of that. Um, the answer, though, um, I would say is is not to move away from scripture or to move to the extra stuff beyond scripture. It's to go deeper into scripture. That this book is the sword of the spirit. You know, that this this book is a sharp two-edged sword. If you're opening the book and you're you're like you're, you're not mm. reading it, you're, mm. you're not reading it properly. If if um, if you're spending time in the word and you're dead. You need to press in harder. You need to pray for this filling of the Spirit to, to apply this book to you more because the Saviour revealed here is alive and living and these are the oracles of the living God. Um, so, so the answer to, to formalism is, is to dig deeper into God's revelation of his son Jesus who is the beauty of the world. You know? So, so yeah, that, that's how I'd, I'd want to push, lean, in, lean there. Not, not I need some extra oomph. If, you know, if I'm looking for some extra oomph or some inject some excitement, maybe I need some new stuff. Maybe I need some new voices in my life, some new prophecy. Actually, this is, this is all you need. Okay. Um, Can I ask one? Yes. A, my, my question. Go so on, healing, which we haven't really touched no, on. No, we haven't. Yeah. Yeah. Is that an, you, you keep using this word extra, mm. and I, I don't think, I still don't quite know what it is. Okay. It sounds, but it sounds suspiciously like at times to me, like it means miracle or anything that isn't the Bible that God might do in the world today. Is is healing an extra in your definition? And therefore, is it something where actually to get preoccupied with praying for the sick to be healed is something beyond scripture? And if, yeah. yeah. That's, that's a helpful question. Um, and I want to emphasize, yeah, cessationism is not about supernaturalism. It's about revelation. I think it's a bit a big, so interesting, the whole section in your book about angels and demons, mm. I'm fully on board, as in mm. angels yeah. and demons are real. Yes. And actually, however, much we might struggle to we have like they are real beings and we need to think mm. much more about them and that's nothing to do with cessationism so, no 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 yeah and so does god heal absolutely are we told to pray for healing in james 5 yes we are the elders of the church are to pray for healing so so um, why is that not an so that's what i'm trying to ask why is that not an extra uh, because, because it doesn't involve revelation yeah so, so the, the, what when so the language of cessationism at least as i understand it comes from um, the Western's Confession of Faith, paragraph one, the first mm. chapter, the former ways in which God revealed himself have now ceased. Mm. That's Hebrews one language. Like mm. God revealed himself in different ways. Now he has spoken in the climax in his son, Jesus. Mm. And with with the unpacking, having acted in Christ, and then that being interpreted by the old, by the New Testament apostles and prophets and, and canonized, that, that that's what you've got. Um, so... Yeah, so so healing hap healing happens. We should pray for it. I do think there's some. I don't think the gift of, uh, but I but I don't believe in healing. So God heals, but there aren't healers. I'm not looking for people with the gift of healing, um, who go around like the apostles, say, commanding oh, so people in the name. Think, of so you do think the gift of healing? So which gifts do you think of? Is it prophecy, tongues, or I couldn't? Yeah, because if in as much so it, where where gifts are revelatory, that they're, they're what cease. Now, so so tongues, I do seem to have a revelatory. So do you think dynamic. the gift of healing is revelatory as well? So I think, like it, it would be a step further, and it would be the gift of healing seems to be. Um, to conf conf confirm the apostolic nature of ministry, to, to it's confirmatory. It's the signs of the apostles. Gift of miracles, um, similarly. Uh, yeah, where's that? Like, like, which in, one, in one Corinthians twelve. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, in terms of the people. So the, the idea of the miracle work. Yeah, the idea that individual people are entrusted with that gift because it seems to me that functions to authenticate the person, to, to give the person a status, an office in the church of some sort, which. In, in, entitles them to act in yeah with, with the authority of Jesus. Um, that that's, that seems to be what's happening. So, um, but I think it's it's, it's a it would be very unhealthy as in it's very unhealthy to start thinking um, the move away from. So if I'm saying there aren't there isn't the gift of healing, there aren't people who are given the the power to heal um, that somehow. I'm anti supernaturalist, or that, that somehow God is removed or reduced from this world. Like, He upholds everything by the word of His power. So. That's obviously not what you're saying, but it's it's been really interesting parsing this out between you both. Thank you very much. Um, as I say, first time in a while we've done this issue, uh, but I think uh, you both really 
brought both your points of view really across really well and graciously. Thank you very much. And uh, thank, thank you, you Andrew. Yes. Thank, thank you, you for yeah, being on the show today. Yeah.